I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish because it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up, they don't see bass popping, they make it a couple casts, they leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. I'm the host of the show, Rich Natoli. I am one of the Salt Strong coaches, generally serving the mid Atlantic to Northeast. And as always, I am joined by the lovely and talented Ed Gobo, owner of Captain Hank's Tackle. Ed, how you doing? I'm doing good, Rich. Doing good. Happy to be here. Yeah, me too. Th this is a great topic uh, for me because I'm going to be learning a lot. I I was talking to our guest Joey Leggio uh, just just a few minutes ago, and I'm not a I'm not a guy who trolls for striped bass. And as a matter of fact, I don't remember ever having trolled for striped bass. I've trolled for tuna bluefish mahi albies wahoo never striped bass so this is not my forte so uh, i'm really excited to to get in here and and learn some things ed what's your experience what, what's your experience with trolling uh, for striped bass? i would say moderate I've, I've done it quite a few times um i mean my biggest bass is called you know come on a on a troll so um you know it's an it's it's different it's not it's not for everyone um, but I think we're here to ask the biggest question tonight is do trolling fish count? Because it seems yes. to be some controversy. Catching bass on the troll doesn't count. So. Yeah. Well, you can ask that question as soon as we bring them on. Just want to say hi to the people that are in the chat right now and all the people that are not chatting but are watching live. Again, for everybody, it is live Monday nights at 8 p.m. We go about an hour and then the audio is repurposed for the audio podcast broadcast on the Salt Strong channel. And it comes out every Friday morning at 5 a.m. This Friday will not be this episode, though. It's kind of a, I think it's a two-week delay. So, um, you know, you come back in a couple of weeks and you'll get this one. But there are more and more going up. As a matter of fact, last Friday we had the episode with, with Captain Scotty Sevens go up. And then we've got uh, the, the next one coming up this Friday. So that's how it goes. Everybody in the chat, uh, welcome. Tidewater Fishing Participation Trophy, Jack West, James Flynn, just Shane, KB7771, Dylan Griffin, Carl Ward, Bill, my man Bill, down in South Jersey. And then we got Peter in there as well. Uh, guys, welcome. Everybody who has not chatted, I don't know your names because I don't, <laughs> I can't see who you are. I see welcome. some new guys tonight, so that's cool. There are definitely some new folks, so it's awesome. So, so welcome, everybody. With that, we're going to jump right in, and we're going to bring on to the stream right now Captain Joey Leggio, Fishing Long Island on YouTube. How you doing, Captain? What's up, guys? How's everything? Oh, man. Doing, doing good. I'm doing awesome. Ed, you've got to lead off. We're going to jump right into this. Trolling for striped bass. Ed, what's the first question? Do they count? Do they actually <laughs> count? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, they count. Lots and lots of people caught their personal best, like you just said it yourself. I mean, absolutely, they count. And, and times have changed, too, with that. You know, it used to be the big old four O's, wire, heavy, big, you know, llama glass, honey-colored rods. And uh, times change, you know. Hey, people still use the wire. I still use it. But now we have braid. We have mojos. We have so many different options now to make it a little bit more enjoyable, you know. You don't go home like Popeye arms. Yeah. <laughs> you have to fish in the wire, but. <clears throat> so, let, so let's start but, off. Okay. I agree. They count. Ed, I know you, you agree. They count. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm from the <clears throat> school of thought that look, you catch them the way that you want to catch them and they all count surf. Yep. They count kayak, boat, trolling, jigging. It's all good. Just have fun when you're out there, but let's start off with this. So where let, let the, the viewers know right now, the specific area that you're typically fishing, what region is that? I'm out of Deb's Inlet, out of Atlantic Beach. Okay. And so, I'm going anywhere. If you go west, you're going towards Rockway Inlet. If I go east, I'm going towards Jones Inlet. So that's okay. basically my little area that I go. Okay. 
All right. And you are, and are you typically doing mostly trolling or are you doing jigging as well? Not so much the jigging. Um, trolling is a great way to find them, but, but this year we had a tremendous bunker run. So that's been phenomenal. Although I'm not getting out as much. Um, the one thing that's great about trolling is you can locate the fish. If you're not seeing them, if you don't see the bunker on the top, you just, you're blind fishing right now. You're trolling. You start getting a lot of knockdowns, you know, then maybe you can locate them. And, and if you wanted to jig at that point, you could do something, bucktail, lure fish, um, flutter spoon, whatever it may be. But uh, I definitely think the trolling is a great way to locate the fish. But this year, like I'm saying, it's, it's completely different. You come outside the inlet, you find a school of bunker, either throw the net on them, fill your live well, throw some circle hooks on them, drop down, and you hook it up. It's just, it's a pretty insane year. And uh, sad that I'm missing it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I have it not is what been it out. Is. I have not been out on the water as much as I'd like. And and the yeah. times that I have been, it's the one captain said, I hate to use this term, but epic. Yeah. <laughs> this season is ridiculous. Uh, yeah. From the New Jersey, New York's, you know, Southern New York side, um, which it would include where you are. And, you know, the people south of us are just, you know, they're drooling, waiting for, <laughs> waiting for this biomass to move by us and get down mm -hmm. there. It's insane. I've never seen as many legit 50 yeah. pound fish in pictures uh, in, you know, take the last two or three years. There were a lot. I think there's already been more this fall than last year and the year before combined. It seems, a, it seems there's been a, a tremendous amount of these, you know, these larger fish. Actually, James from Hooks for Heroes, I believe he had a 55 this year, which is a tremendous fish. I mean, shit, wow. 55 pound there's amazing. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I wish I could get that. The closest I've gotten so far is about, I'm, I'm not really measuring them when they're over, you know, over slot, but um, the largest that I, that I semi measured, I just, it was about 47 and that, oh, that's yeah. it. So I'm still looking for that 50 inch, let alone the 50 pound. Yeah. Um, but you know, we'll get there. We'll get there. So let's, let's start talking about the trolling. So you want to just start off with what type of gear are you using when you're when you're heading out there <clears throat> well i still do a lot of wire you know so basically now i'm, I'm a four rods uh troll right now so on my out at my out rod is what the out rodders are the things that put the rods out basically to the sides kind of like outriggers if you want to call it that so now it gives your boat a much further spread so if you have two eight foot rods that's 16 feet plus the width of your boat you know your 10 foot boat whatever it may be eight foot boat so now that, that gets you spread so those two rods are either going to be with wire. I like to use stainless over Monel, <clears throat> and those will be your two spoons. Now, in my two inner rod racks, those will be my two mojos. So as long as you have enough guys on the boat, you could do that with the four rods. If you don't have as many guys, maybe go to a three or a two, a one and a one, you know, one mojo on one rod and a spoon on the other. But if I have, you know, if I have enough guys, I'll definitely do the four rod troll. And um, what I'll do is basically 24 ounce on one. And if I want to go the, the heavier, I think it's a 32 ounce or I'll do the tandem on that one, you know, like, a, like a, I think it's a, um, I think it's a 16, eight or something, or I'll do two 24s. The 24s work fantastic in my area. They get at just the right depth and uh, they troll really good. The only problem with the 24s, you seem to lose more fish. I think cause it's the weight of that ball of the lead. Right. Right. Now what, what speed are you typically going to be trolling <clears throat> when you're now? I, I understand you're going to adjust as you see what the bite is doing. Yeah. But what are you starting out with as your your trolling speed when you you drop your four rods out? What speed are you looking for? Okay, now, I know you're probably talking RPMs. Uh, <laughs> you know that, that's that's how I used to always do. It's just I, I didn't care the speed. I went to RPMs. But what what speed are you going? All right. Well, just let's rewind one second. So we're yeah. not going to worry about the mojos right now because if you're going to do a combo with both the spoon and the mojo, the mojos work no matter what. There is no technique to it. Put in the water and troll, and that tail is going to wiggle going to catch fish so more importantly is you got to watch the spoon rods now and adjust your speed accordingly to the spoons so a good starting speed is anywhere from like three one to three five knots <clears throat> so that's kind of like four miles an hour right that's a good starting speed now from there just watch the tips of your rod you want that good pulse you know a nice rhythm doom 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 if you see going too fast that's your spoon spinning you know so you want that spoon basically like that you know, right. you have the concave and the convex. Did I say it right? I'm not good at science, but whatever. <laughs> you have the whole thing, you know, and that's spoons swirling back and forth like that. And that's going to be your pump. You're going to see the pump there. You're going to see the pump there. You're going to see the pump there. And as it comes down, that's the release on the rod. And you'll see it going back and forth. Speaking about spoons, these are two different spoons right here. So these are two very common spoons. This one right here. I don't know if you can see that. It's a Tony Maja. And this is a oh, TGT. Let's you get that? you...
There you go. There you go. Okay. So here's two different spoons. Now, one thing I never do is I'll never troll these two together. It's either going to be two of these or two of those. And the reason being, the Tony Maja spoon requires less speed to get it to work correctly. So you might be able to get this spoon pumping at 3-2, let's just say. Okay. This spoon, the TGT spoon, requires a little more speed. This one, you might need to do 4-2. So you really can't troll these two together because you're never going to get either one. One's going to be working. The other one's going to be doing something crazy. Right. So <clears throat> one of the things you definitely want to do the same two spoons. doesn't matter. You could do different colors. You know, this one's like a bronze white. You could do a green white, yellow white. This one's a hot color. I think it's like it's copper. Uh, my favorite one is the chartreuse and the green. That's my favorite spoon out of the Tony Maja spoons. These are the number four, as you can see, right somewhere over there. But, um, yeah, so definitely want to keep the spoons together definitely use the same brand <clears throat> now uh, he told me, tony told me that uh you could use the four and the two together because they're the same design just different sizes right because those two will swim together so this is the bigger one and then the other one's probably like that you know so looks more like a smaller bunker versus an adult bunker so maybe you put the uh the two larger on the outside and then on the in rods inside rods you're going to drop the two smaller ones maybe no you know i won't do that because the swing so now you have oh. four rods swinging. So the mojos run straight. Right. Because that would be, you do a turn or something, those things are swinging. And the worst thing you want to do is get a tangle with wire. It's yeah. unforgiving <laughs> and it costs a ton of money when you just have to take it and throw it in the garbage. I've done that. You really, yeah. <laughs> it, it kinks. And once it yeah. kinks, it's over. And you don't want to take the chance of getting a 50. Like, oh, it's fine. It's a small kink. You, you put it back out and bink, two seconds, it pops. Any pressure is going to pop that wire. Right. So, and these things are like 50 bucks now, you know? By tomorrow with the inflation will be 60, but that's besides the point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. You know, it's expensive tackle, but you always want to make sure. Actually, one year we were filming with my buddy Raph and we put a camera on it and the wire snapped and he lost his camera, the spoon, and the fish. Man. He lost everything. Yeah, that was yeah that's camera. that's expensive. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. lost his underwater. The, the footage would have been great if we got it, but <laughs> I, I hate to laugh, except I've lost an underwater camera. So I, I feel like I'm allowed <laughs> to laugh at it now. You can laugh. You can laugh. <laughs> Oh, I'm not going to say we lost a drone this year, too, but that's besides the point. Sorry, Raph, if you're watching. <laughs> oh, that's right. The Cobia. The Cobia yeah. trip, right? <laughs> yeah, one in the water. Uh, but, by the way, I love those videos. Um, he does a nice job, Raph, on his videos, too. He, he does a really good job. Here, yeah. Here's a comment that I think that we should put up there right now. Always thought a spoon was supposed to spin. And and you so you had mentioned that you you want the – you don't want it spinning. You want it w kind of waggling back and forth. And and could you just describe in detail what that specifically <laughs> looks like when it's out there? I mean, you're going to be looking at the okay. rod tip. Yeah, you're watching the rod tip. Well, well, let's talk about the rods real quick, and I'll go into that question. Okay. You definitely want like eight foot rods, eight to nine foot, and you want something softer to actually make that motion. It, it enhances it a little bit. It'll work with it, you know. So basically, the motion you want to see. So if this is the spoon coming at you, it's basically going like this, and it's it's dipping and diving like this. That's how that spoon's work. And there are videos on YouTube, I'm sure you could see, where people do put the cameras on the spoons, you yep. know, ahead of the line. You could see the action. If you're spinning like this, it's definitely not going to work. That might be more for, like, salmon fishing. I'm not sure, because they do spoon fish for salmon as well. I've never done it, so I don't know. I can't give a fair answer on that. But with this spoon, is basically going to dive and then come back and then dive, you know. And this, this spoon right here will do a little bit. I think this one does a little bit smaller of the thing. You know, it's a little tighter mm -hmm. on the movement. This is a little bit wider. You know, let's say this is like a three-foot sweep. This one might be a two-foot sweep. So that you definitely want that sweep in motion like this. And and what are you – what depth are you running those spoons at or what depth will they run at? Um, with the 300 feet of wire, you're getting like 30 feet down. You know, they say it's 10 every um, – 10 feet, 100 feet, 100 feet of wire, 10 feet down. Sorry about that. Right. Um, but that really doesn't matter because you want if you're marking the fish at 20 feet, you're not putting 300 feet of wire down because right. you're not going to be below the fish, and, and these fish strike up. So you want to be above them. So now if you see the fish at 20 feet, you could put 200 feet of wire out, and you'll be in that 20-foot range. The faster you go, the spoon's going to rise. The slower you go, the spoon will sink. But something in that area, you know, 180 feet maybe, if you're marking them there. But always a good starting point is most people are fishing at 30 to 40 feet. They dump all the wire out. You know, it's just like the go-to. And then you just got to watch your fish finders. You got to see, you got to locate them and see where they are. Right. A lot of times you don't see the fish. They're like coming from the sides. You'll never mark a fish and boom, boom, you get a double header. The rods go off. Yeah. So <clears throat> that sounds like tuna fishing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the most tuna that I've caught, we never marked anything. <laughs> we caught a lot of fish though. 
Yeah. And we just weren't marketing. They were Blowing coming in from behind. behind. Yep. Coming in from the sides and then straight up the, well, we saw them coming after the baits. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we didn't know where they came from at all. So, all right. So, so those are the spoons. And so they're, they're on wire. You're always using wire when you're using spoons. No, I do have braid uh, setups as well. Okay. So with the braid, you could either get a, like one of the real heavy spoons. Um, oh my God. I forgot what it's called now. I totally forgot. Tommy makes them. I just forget what this. Oh, the secret spoon. And uh, this, my friend Tommy makes those. They have like five or six weights on them. So the spoons weigh over a pound. Right. So you go with that. Well, what I would do is I use a one pound drill. And to me, the one pound drill is equal to the weight of the, the, the 300 yards of stainless wire. They're both about a pound. So I'll put that on. And we experimented with that. You, you definitely got to use like a 15 foot leader with that, so, which kind of sucks. You got to hand line the fish in at that point once you get yeah. the weight up to the tip of the rod. But um, it seems when it's shorter than that, it doesn't get that swing that it needs because the weight does take some of that away. And you'll see it in the rod tip. It's not as pronounced the pump on that when you're using the drill. But the braid is nice because it's a lot easier to reel in, even though you still have a one pound weight in on the, uh, the line. Right. But for that, I'm using one rod has 65 and the other rod has 55 uh, on the braid with those. But um, that's one way of doing it. Or you could do a combo rig. You could do a, a three-way with 15 feet and have your spoon on that. And then you could do like three, four feet down and have, say, a 16-ounce mojo. <clears throat> you could do that as well. My sister-in-law actually had her biggest bass that way. She had a 49-incher with that combo. You know, on the way in, too, it was funny. We're getting ready to pull the rods, and also the rod went out. So you definitely that's get some nice feeling. fish that way, too. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely good. But that's one I way of doing it. Or, of course, the wire. It's never fun bringing those in, though, at the last second because now you've got the extra hooks flying around, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're trying to pull them in the boat. And the drail, yeah. personally, the drail to me was always <clears throat> a difficult part because it does mess up everything. And it's the part that's the biggest risk at landing this fish, and now all of a sudden you're hand lining it. Yeah. Which uh, I've never found that to be a lot of fun. And you have to, yeah, to get it in. It's the only way. Yeah. You definitely got to be careful with that weight because that thing starts swinging. Like, don't put it in the rod rack and leave that weight hanging up top because that's going to first of all break your rod. It's got a one pound weight swinging all over the place if it's rough. So, basically, you could take it, you can grab it, throw it into a, a free rod holder, you know, on, on the gunnel, just put it in there, it'll slip right in, and then hand line it. And, you know, have yeah. your net guy, well, really can't gaff anymore because these fish are all oversized. So, right. either net it or a lipper, you know, to get the fish, get your rig back and send them on his way. Yeah, and keep in mind, don't let it swing on the outside of the boat either because yeah, no. you'll number on the glass. <laughs> the gel cloak guys, they don't mind. You can leave it hanging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're happy. No problem. They're, they're all like supporting it right now. Yep. <laughs> no, that's exactly what you should do. Ed, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask about the rods and the reels for the wire. Um, they Are they a specialized setup for to, to handle the wire? They are. So... There's a bunch of rods out there. I have Daiwa rods and I have Tony Maja rods. Those are the two rods I'm using. Um, on my Daiwa rods, I have the braid. <clears throat> on the Tony Maja rods, those I have the wire on them. He has like the carboloid guides on those, both soft rods, both great rods. And uh, the reels, the 4.0 Senator was always the go-to reel. It had the stainless, I don't know if it was stainless, I think it was like a bronze with some sort of coating on it. Uh, if you use the aluminum spools, it starts pitting right away. Unless you rinse it really well, like I really rinse them. I basically will stick the hose into the wire and blast all the salt away as best I could. But, um, and also you want to clean your wire after every season, I'll walk it out. I'll go to a school football field and I'll run out the 300 feet and I'll take WD 40 on a rag and I'll hold the wire and I'll reel it right back in to clean all that gook and sediment off of that. And that, and that gives a little bit more life to the wire as well. But, um, yeah, and you want a softer rod, you know, eight foot to nine foot rods are great. Uh, Seeker makes one, Daiwa, Tony Maja, there's a bunch of companies. Um, and then you can always go custom if you wanted, <clears throat> you know, be definitely the main thing is you want something soft. You don't want something too stiff. The, uh, like the tsunami bunker smooth rods, they're a little bit too stiff for my liking. You know, they don't really have that sponginess <laughs> that the other rods mentioned have, <clears throat> um, other reels you have the, uh, you could use the Daiwa reels, but you want to make sure you, you know, rinse those, make sure if it's an aluminum spool, spool, you definitely got to take care of it. The Okuma reel, the line count, I've been seeing people use that now, um, the Shimano, the Dakotas, I've been people uh, seeing people use. But um, again, if these have aluminum spools, you got to take that little bit of extra time to really clean them out well. And also, you know, you're spending a lot of money. Get you, get yourself the outrodders. So you, that's your first investment. Besides the rod, you want the two outrodders to get those rods trolling sideways. I also think they troll better than when it's straight up like this. Yeah. Uh, you want your leashes too, because you want to protect your investment. You know, if that butt cracks or breaks, and it could happen, it's happened before. 
that that's going overboard. You're losing everything. But at least with the leash, even though the rod broke, you can still pull in your reel, your line, your fish, your lure, and not lose that. So those leashes are, are pretty good too. Yeah, I that's a good I've tip. had rods go over. Yeah, you know, it and it always happens when the <clears throat> rod breaks. When the rod breaks and it snaps back, that's usually when you end up losing it. Yeah. It's also good too. Get those cheap little belts, little kidney belts. Yeah. Because sometimes with the wire, you know, you get tied. Also, you get those things that go on the butts. That like little cushion thing. Yeah. And sometimes they'll make a T. Yeah, that or the T. Yeah. You could pop on it. It's such cheap little things. But you know what? Instead of having a gimbal blasting you in the side, you'd have that. And it makes it a little bit more comfortable and a little bit easier to fight the fish too. Man, I'm thinking I need to start trying or at least go out one time and troll for striped bass. Because <laughs> I, I just keep relating it to tuna. And <laughs> I got you, Rich. We'll, we'll get out. <laughs> I'm with you. I'll go with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll all have to jump out there. Um, all right. So there, so. I, I think a, a, an important part there that everyone should keep in mind is when you're talking about the gear for the rods, you can't go with the telephone poles that aren't going to move because no. these spoons, if you're, if you're fishing the spoons, especially because yeah. you have to allow it to work and you have to allow the action to work and mm -hmm. it's not going to do that on telephone pole. No. It's just going to kind of skip around and it's not going <laughs> to look good. Uh, sorry, Even so with the mojos too, mm -hmm. you know, you, like, yeah, this is my mojo rod right here. Come on, get it. I'm gonna poke something in my house but so there's two ways to do this so let me see can you see that yep. so this happens to be a line counter which is right here this helps out tremendously if i'm getting these fish at 120 feet out i know exactly where to put this when i get a fish and release it to set it back out i go right back to 120. now say you don't have this the other option is the line you can see it's multicolored. yep so every 33 feet this line changes color so three colors it's out 100 feet basically nine colors it's out 300 feet so that's another good thing. So if you don't have the line count, let's say you're going with an old Jigmaster 500, you know, you can put this on and you can still know exactly where you are. Just have nobody talking to you when you let out the line because you're like, one, two, three, what else? Oh, wait, where was yeah. I now? <laughs> Rewind, <laughs> reel it reel back it in back and start again. But um, yeah, and this is a graph I reel, so it's very light. This whole setup is extremely light. And you can see it's a little bit shorter. But this has play in it too because the ones with the mojos, I don't, I don't want to snap it, but you can see this is pretty soft too. Yeah. Yet it's got the back one. The thing with mojos is you're dealing with tremendous weights. So you kind of want that rod to absorb some of that weight. So if that fish runs, now you have a stiff rod, that thing's going to rip it right out. Whereas the rod yeah. will take some of that if it bends, you know, a little bit softer to uh, you know, absorb that heavy weight and stuff. And another thing too, I'm sorry, I'm looking at notes as I speak to you, is that when you do get a hookup, first of all, when you hook a fish, that rod goes off. A lot of people get excited, throw that boat in neutral. Don't do that. Keep going. Because a lot of times you can get a double, a triple. Same thing with tuna fishing, exact same thing. <clears throat> you get a hookup, there's plenty of line in those reels. That reel screaming, keep going yeah. a little bit longer because you, it's very pro you know, the probability you could get that second one, you know, and then have two on that two on that, which would be great. Another thing is that once you have it done, okay, you have your fish, you have your one, maybe you got the double, keep it an idle speed. You want to keep tension on that rod. Again, these are spoons, there's, there's mojos, there's a lot of weight. And these fish are going back and forth and they can make that hole bigger and bigger in their mouth. And they get the slightest bit of slack that that spoon is going to fall out. And they'll read things too. You really don't want to pump too much on the rods. You kind of like just want to crank, maybe it's a slight little pump, but don't give any slack whatsoever. So if you have a higher retrieve reel, that makes it a little bit easier because you can pick up that line a little quicker. But some people you'll see them fight and they'll drop the rod and they're like, oh shit, you know what you do that for? And the fish is gone. You can't give it any type of slack because it's going to pop out. And a lot of times, I mean, you never trolled, but you ever see, like, you'll put these fish on the deck, and a second hits the deck, the spoon falls out of its mouth. Yeah. You know, as soon as that pressure gets off. So definitely idle speed. You get a fish, keep trolling, keep going. You know, a couple seconds, whatever. Just see if you're going to get that second hookup, you know, and keep it in idle speed. Yeah, well, I, th that's a big <laughs> thing. I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Not only just keep the hook in its mouth, but the second that you back it out into neutral, which I see a lot of people do. It's really entertaining to be up in the Raritan Bay. The one guy ruins the bite by trolling through the middle of all the guys catching on the yeah. on the thing. And then they hook up and they go to neutral. Yep. And you watch you watch four, six lines all sink around. Yeah. <laughs> which which just means you're gonna lose all your gear because you, now you're all tangled up as you start spinning and fighting that one. Yeah, no, fish. you gotta so keep it in gear, definitely. You gotta keep it in gear, keep it moving, you know, even if it's just in gear. Um yeah. you know, but I have had fish you know as everybody who's trolled for anything <clears throat> sorry that they just drop that hook the second they hit the deck yeah you know because it does i think it does just just why by keeping it in gear it's going to stretch out that hole in their in their mouth 
Yeah. You know, or in, in their lip or wherever you and got they, them. Look at it. I mean, these are, these are big hooks. And look at this. If it bites its hook, what does it got? This, this thing is going to work its way out. Yeah, the leverage, least, you know, it's the leverage that the, yeah. the lure has is more than what the hook can handle. Exactly. That's a lot <clears> of leverage on that that size. I mean, yeah, especially with is, the spoon in front. I mean, that's that's a ridiculous amount. See this? We, this is a 24 ounce. I mean, look at it. If you could feel this, you could kill somebody with this. Yeah. That's a big giant piece of lead. That's a 24 ounce mojo, you know. And even still with these two hooks, you're losing the fish. Yeah. I want you to see that. We do have uh, two questions that came through that uh, I'd like to touch on. Yep. Um, James Flynn asked what rod, uh, when you had the mojo rod up, what, what oh, rod it's a is rod. that? So it's a Daiwa reel, a Daiwa rod. And this is, this is called the VIP saltwater. I'm in my kitchen. I'm trying not to beat up my Yeah, kitchen. yeah. <laughs> so VIP saw what I don't have my glasses on, but it looks like it's the model shit. 865H. It's six foot six inches and it's rated for line 20 to 50 pound. Okay. And what, and what pound line or these have 50. 50. 50 okay. pound yep. And uh either 80 or 60 pound liters. Oops, it goes to the ceiling. Yeah, they're actually really nice little setups. And they don't yeah, they look the like I was going to say, it looked like a nice rod. Um, and then we had another one from James uh, Stam. Uh, That's my talk, buddy. Hey, James. <laughs> talk, can you talk on the strategy of launching spoons and mojos, especially if alone? That, that yeah. right there is a great question because one thing that you do run into, and I've had people say, you know, there were a couple of times where I was going to go trolling last year for striped bass. And the first question that the captain asked is, have you ever trolled spoons? Because I need people that know how to troll spoons and help me get it, get the set out. Um, so I think that's a good question. The strategy when you're launching this. Okay. Well, for starters, it's, it's like, if you're looking forward, you think your boat's straight and it's probably not. So the best way to do it is put your boat in gear, get your one rod set out, be done with it. Once your one rod's out, that's fine. There's nothing to tangle. It's your first rod out. Your second rod, your propeller is going to make a stream. You know, that white water that comes behind your propeller. Just follow. If you can keep that straight, you know exactly how your boat's going. I'm not saying don't look in front of you because you definitely don't want to crash, but keep an eye on your prop wash and see what it's looking at. Make sure that's straight. Hold your rod out and start letting it out. If you see that you made a quick left or a quick right, now that line shooting across that prop wash, you're going to get tangled. So make sure you're watching that prop wash. Make sure it's straight. And if you see that it starts swinging, thumb the reel right away and hold it until it straightens out again. Once it straightens out, then start letting out the line and see your desire, you know, how far out you want to go, 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, whatever it may be. But uh, if, you're, if you're looking forward, you have no idea what's going behind you. You could be doing this for all you know. You have no idea. Just stare at the back of the boat. Watch it. Keep your hand on the steering wheel. Listen, one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on the rod, you know, and just slowly letting it out. Or if you're by yourself, if you are, you could always just troll one rod. You could do that as well. And also, again, that's where the out rod has come into play is that now that rod is, you know, eight feet further away from you. So you have a little bit more play in that, you know, now when you're, when you're letting them out, you're doing a controlled release <clears throat> of that, of that spoon or mojo or anything back there. So you're keeping tension on it. You're letting it swim the entire way. Correct. Okay, Not on a spoon. If you do that with a spoon, it's going to stay up. Yes. Because now it's kind of like a boat, you know, it's right in the water. So what you want to do is that spoon, you basically want to let it free drop, but not to the point where you're going to get a bird's nest. So very right. light tension and let that free drop. Don't leave your clicker on, take your clicker off. You want no tension except slight from your thumb, just so you don't screw up the wire. Let that drop as natural and as free as possible to get it to the depth as desired. I've seen it that if you thumb it and you're keeping tension on it, the, the thing pops. It'll come to the surface sometimes because it just never really dug in and got to where it needed to be. Right. So you might think, oh, great, my spoon's at 30 feet. Everybody's catching at 30 feet. I'm not catching anything. Well, that's because your spoon's at 10 feet of water. You know, it, you, you put too much pressure and that thing's just riding and riding. You know, it, it is. I mean, it's the best way to describe it. It's like a boat. How many times you reel in the spoon really quick and it pops on the surface and it's just riding out there and you reel yeah. it all the way in, which is a blessing sometimes because now you're not fighting the spoon. <laughs> you just crank right. it right in to check for weed or whatever. But well, especially the spoons that size that yeah it could be a blessing but you just wasted 20 minutes of trolling <laughs> yeah exactly. trolling so way over sure. their heads uh, and one more quick thing actually i just thought of too when you get a hookup just like the freaking cobia a lot of times as followers so you could have like have a pitch rod ready either with a bunker chunk on it or now with these guys i don't know if you see that yeah, uh, the these flutter, flutter spoons. spoons 
if you see a follower and you got everything and you got one rod, everything's taken care of, you got an extra guy, flip it back there. You know, this thing's fluttering back into that where that fish is. Don't get it tangled in the line, whatever you do, but you might get another one, you know. But we used to do that with the bunker chunks. We'd have a chunk ready and you'd pull up and you see, you know, two, three follows. You flip that chunk and boom, that rod goes off. Now you doubled up, you know. So it's always good to have a rod ready to pitch. Always, actually, especially now with this, this Kobe fishing that's been going on. It's, in, you know, you've seen the video, what happens with that. So, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. now are you leaving all of so you hook up on let's say you hook up on a mojo on the inside are you leaving the other lines out or are you bringing them in uh for a little bit i don't leave them out because i don't want to snag the bottom eventually that boat's going to go slow enough where they're going right. to go down especially the mojos but um you know everybody has a job on the boat there's enough guys and uh, i usually grab the rod with the fish hand it to a guy you know and let them start cranking in on that and get the close one in first and then work the spoons out and get them in too okay but, you know, also with trolling, here's like a little tip here. If you're trolling, say, to the north, right, and you keep getting fish, and then you, you finish your troll, you start heading back now, you're trolling south, and you get nothing. Turn the boat around, you troll to the north, boom, boom, you start getting hits again. Stop going to the south. So what you do is that you, you do in your north, you get your fish, boom, you stop. Once you pull up those lines and you're desired, you're ready to come back, just pick up the, the, the rods and go. Shoot right back to the north. So go one mile in shore, let's just say. Turn around, deploy your rods, go again. You'll get the fish. A lot of times these bass will only hit in one direction, which doesn't make sense. But whether it's the currents making the spoons act different, who knows what it is. But they'll hit and just say a north direction or just a south. And you'll see it. You'll say, man, every time I spin around, you know, everybody does circles. Boom, right. boom. You know, and if you're not getting it, don't waste that time. Because that's like an hour's worth of trolling sometimes. <laughs> Depends on how far out you are. And if you're going from 30 to 60 feet, that's a long, you know, it's a long troll. So if you notice that, just, just pick up the rods. Don't even waste your time. Just right. go back to the north to where you start in point, 30 feet, whatever it may be, and start trolling back out again. And the same thing to east to west. Right, yeah. Stop wasting time. <clears throat> it takes a while to get set up, so just reel them in yeah. and fly on back. There, there's a So while you're talking about the, the followers, um, pencil poppers. Are you, are you ever using anything like the the top waters when you when you're bringing in that fish? That's if I use a pencil popper, that's when I'm like fishing the marshes or something, some shallow water. That's like a, a definitely a surf fishing thing, the pencil poppers. But I'm sure it'll work out there. Like right now, the guys are using the, the top water stuff because it's shallow water. They're on these bunkers, and you'll get these fish coming out from the bunkers, blowing up on the uh, the docks. Like it's like kind of it's like a pencil popper, a yeah. walk the dog type of lure. Um, a pencil popper, as uh, he was saying, it would work. But trolling, I, I never, I, I never really tossed a pencil popper. They they work for mahi. Again, I've never trolled for <laughs> striped bass like that, yeah. so I, I wouldn't really know. Um, they they do work really well for mahi if, if you have them out there. In general, pencil poppers are awesome for striped bass, though. So yeah. you know, if if you want to fish a pencil popper for striped bass, there's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't be trying it, uh, whether it's, it's a, inshore or near shore. Mm -hmm. great bait just a different application yeah, yeah you definitely got to work that right too you know definitely got to get that thing pop it yeah so, and that can be a little difficult when you're out in the waves depending on how far you're out what, <clears throat> what kind of chop you have i mean it seems like the best days are the windy days and that's yeah. the most difficult day to to work a pencil popper too i think all the surfers are like that northeast wind i think that's the wind they say is the one i don't surfish so i don't know but this is what i heard northeast <laughs> Yeah, well, wind. we learned we learned this this mm -hmm. uh, this year of the another wind that works. Now it depends on what direction uh, your shoreline faces, but the west winds right, and the northwest because the bunker turn into the wind, and okay. it brings it into the surf. Yeah. So not that that really matters offshore, but something to keep in mind that if the winds coming from the east, the bunker are going to as filter feeders would be facing more towards the east and moving towards the east. Okay. So, you know, that, that can makes help. sense for the north. And I've heard that before that they swim into the uh, into the wind. So yeah. that's why a north wind would be good by us because north is coming off the beach. Yeah. Full Long Island. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we touched on, we, we did pretty in depth on the spoons. What about mojos? Uh, there's multiple brands of mojos you can get. Um, if I'm inshore, like, you know, say, like, say from 15 to 30 feet of water, I like that 8 4 combo. That's a nice little setup and catches a lot of fish. It works good. If you're going deeper, then I start going into the 16s, the 24s, and, and the singles. You know, I do have a heavy uh, combo. It's um, I think it's a 24-6, and I have a 16-6. Then you can use those, too, if you're going a little deeper water. But I, I just always feel that like the singles work best in the deeper water. 
but I, I love the eight four. One time, actually, the guys were trolling in that shallow water and they were catching nothing and were mocking the hell out of the fish. So I said, oh, screw it, let's throw the mojos in. And we did a, a pair of whites and a pair of greens. And I always like to change up the colors too and see, you know, if they start hitting all in whites and, you know, put the yellow one all white. So we start off with the two colors and um, we start catching fish. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And we started getting like basically one after another on these mojos. Well, back at the dock, when we opened them, they were all filled with weak fish, which, you know, baby uh. weak fish would made sense too, because that's exactly what a mojo would look like. It's got the same, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, same profile. Silhouette. Yeah, the profile. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Of that fish. And it was pretty wild how the spoons weren't working. The spoons were catching bluefish and the bass were hitting the mojos. Now, now for those that don't know, can you give a breakdown of like how a mojo works and it's designed? Uh, basically, a, a mojo does all the work for you. I like a speed is probably like two and a half to you can go up to four, you know, knots on that. They will work fast, but you know, you want to go a little slower, keep them a little deeper, you know, see where they are. Uh, one of the ways of deploying a mojo is the line counter, or what people like to do is they'll just let it out, free fall, let it hit the bottom, put your thumb on it, let it rise, let it go again, let it hit the bottom again, and lock up your reel and troll there. That was like a, an easy way to get the, the, uh, the mojos out. Um, when you're doing out a double, sometimes be a little careful because sometimes they'll get tangled together and you'll feel it. There'll be a lot of pressure on the rod. Again, reel it in and restart. Uh, you also got to be careful for seaweed. Sometimes if you hit the bottom, you load up the mojos with seaweed, which sucks because the, the bass won't hit the line, hit the seaweed on it. So you're trolling the line, not knowing what you have on that lure and you're not going to get a hit. Um, again, this one is the 24. Uh, I believe so, these are dots and stuff right here. So on, on the mojos, there's, they're linked together with mono. So is yeah. the heavier one is the leader, is it the correct? The heavy one is the shorter leader. Okay. So this is going to be the close one. And then this is going to be, you know, three, four feet up, five feet, whatever it may be. Sorry, screen it to a three-way. And then your three-way, then you'll have 15 feet of line that will go to the to the lighter one. What I would do is I always put the lighter one out first just to get it away. And then I'll just slowly lower this into the water. Because these things are bombs, so they're really heavy. And just lower this one down. And then slowly let it go down. With this, you don't have to like really free drop it. You could thumb it a little just because of the weight that's on here. The singles, you could just let it rip if you want. But with the double, you want to be a little bit more careful just so you don't get tangled with them. But yeah, and if, like when, when we fish, we primarily fish the mojos and the umbrella rigs. <laughs> so we'll drop the the longer one out first, let that line, you know, um, yeah, that's itself out, yeah, and then exactly. we drop the heavier one and then let it let the whole thing go. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, same thing. Just let that, let it get away. Get the, the, the lighter one away from the boat, and just take that heavy one, and you know, just put it in and let it go, and then slowly let it go out with the rod. But the mojos are great now. A lot of people switch to it. Some guys aren't even trolling wire anymore; they're just going straight mojos because it catches fish and it, it's easy. You don't have to worry about the speeds or anything. It does the work for you. This tail is just going to start going. You know, once that's in the current, it just goes. It's got that little paddle tail. It's, there. it's a giant paddle tail. Yeah, <laughs> and once it hits, it just starts. It starts doing the work for you, and they definitely work. They're effective lures. You know, it's funny. You look at some of the things that have come out or become, you know, maybe they're older, but have become popular in recent years, and they've totally changed the game. You know, the spot lock has mm -hmm. totally changed people's ability to, for bottom fishing, as an mm -hmm. example. You know, so uh, trolling motors on saltwater boats is a big Sick. one. Sick. Those things are uh, <laughs> crazy. And then the mojos. Motor. Yep. And then the mojos on the the uh, the equipment that you need, it, be, it just became easier. You know, it's easier to spot lock on a piece than to set two anchors. Yeah, It's easier 100%. to toss a mojo over, uh, for, especially for your bank <clears throat> account, than to have specialty rod setups for 83 different types of trolling, mm -hmm. you know, trolling gear that you, that you may have or lures that you may want to throw out there. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons, well, first of all the mojos work but i think that's yeah, also yeah, part yeah. of it you don't have to have special rods for everything anymore not really no except the spoon right. rods the spoon rods the spoon different. rods right yeah that rod behind me that i showed you you could use that for chunking you could use it for umbrella rigs if you wanted to you know you put a drill weight on it you could basically use it for anything it's got yeah. the line capacity do you do you use the umbrella rigs too or no i haven't used an umbrella rig in forever i used to use the shad rigs a lot but not the the actually like the umbrella one. I like the uh, the hanger style, just the one straight yeah. on with five lures. Or for that used to be a great lure, which nobody really uses anymore. But that you used to catch so many fish on that. And also another great lure for trolling is a. Uh, I actually have a video on my YouTube page. You could see it. Is I have a uh, like the Rapala spoon. I mean, uh, excuse me, um, diving lure. Mm -hmm. It's like the big lip deep divers. Yeah. And then I have that to a three way, 
And then like six feet behind that, I put the little clock spoons. And that really works really well, especially by you in Raritan Bay. You can crush the bass on that thing. It, it works awesome. What are they hitting? The Clark spoons or the both, Rapala? Both. You'll get them really? on both. Yeah, mostly mostly the Rapala, but you will get them on both. You get them on the okay. Clark spoons too. Yeah, you check that video out. You'll see it. You'll see. I build the whole thing and show how it's done. But that law works fantastic, especially in Raritan Bay, like that shallow water. Yep. I got one more and then I'm done. Uh, <laughs> the uh, when you're trolling mojos, do you run the stretch down the middle or no? You could. I mean, there's nothing wrong with running a stretch law. The stretch laws work great. You're talking about the stretch 30, right? The, yeah, 25, the 30. Or, yeah, yeah, the they're, mans, they're yeah. different sizes. They're, they're yeah, big. you could totally do that. Again, just be careful. Again, that, again, put those out rodders out because that's gonna help you out. Because sometimes you ever see those man's laws, they boom, they shoot to the side and something, they catch something and they'll go. And again, that will tangle that up and, and it's a total cluster, you know the word. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but you totally could do that. Exactly, because it's it's the speed doesn't matter when you when you're using those lures now. There's no watching the tips of the rods. You will see with the mojos, you will see the tip of the rod jitter as that mm -hmm. tail's swimming. You will see that. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, like I said, there's really no set speed. You want the lure to go deep or slow down a little bit. You want it to come up a little bit, speed up a little, and you know how the lure will work on that. You ever jig them while you're trolling? You could actually jig the mojos, kind of yeah. like a parachute. So if you see the fish and they're not hitting, you can just you know start working that mojo and pop it, and boom. Sometimes you get hits that way as well. You know that, that happens a lot. If you're trolling, you could see them. You're not getting them. Just do some sort of action. And and bass are weird. Like you get them on the turns. You know, like what did you do yes. different? Is it because it, the one spoon went deeper and this one came up? I don't think so. I think it's because the action changed. So they could be found. This thing's a steady, same thing. Also, the spoon does a little something different because you turned or maybe it's not working as hard. You know, what would now it's more like a dead thing and fluttering down. I don't know why, but you know, you'll get you do get hits a lot on the turns. So something changed and you know, to causing them to strike. So that's why we'll parachute them, we'll pop them with the mojos. And another thing, we've actually done it with the spoons too. So you hook up with a spoon. So as you're reeling that other spoon, start popping the spoon, which is crazy. You wouldn't think that would work, but you again, you're changing the action. It's, it's totally going erratic. It's going nuts. The lure, you pop and crank, pop and crank, pop and crank, and boom, that rod gets slammed. You just It's all about changing that action and getting them to strike. Yeah. They could be following that lure who knows how long. They're just sitting behind it, watching it, watching it. You ever see the videos like the kingfish following the lures of the wahoo? They just follow and all of a sudden, boom, they strike and they come like full right. speed. They'll, they'll back up a little and then, boom, they fly at it and slam it. I guess bass is the same thing. Yeah. I mean, well, you see it. You see it in the backwaters, especially, right? When you're fishing in the marshes and you, you toss it out there and you're pulling in the top water, for example, mm -hmm. and you could just see it following. It's yeah. just kind of like waking right behind it and doing you its see the Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you bring it all the way right up to the boat and they don't turn away until you, you essentially pull the thing out of the water. <laughs> I mean, they'll follow forever. Yeah. I, I would guess that you're getting a lot of those hits on the turns because you get the drop you know a lot of times with striped bass they'll, they'll hit on that drop and uh maybe that's what it is especially if it's the inside rod well, the inside's gonna drop the outside's yep. gonna raise the inside's gonna drop and it kind of like if you think about it it's like a flutter spoon now it's just yep. fluttering down going deeper <coughs> i'm sorry but um yeah that's what i think but again it's just the the, the most the uh the rhythm has changed it's not that right. same rhythm anymore something change and cause them to strike right uh, here's a question for you. And, and this goes to spots. So basically the question here, um, are there any signs of where the stripers are or where they'll be when you start to troll? So how are you, <laughs> let, let's, let's take it. Let's take it from this perspective. And I think this will get the comprehensive answer when you're going to head out. Let's say you don't have any reports at your disposal. You don't know what anyone has done the past week. What are you specifically going to be looking for when you break that inlet? Number one thing would be bait. <clears throat> if you could find bait, that's awesome. If not, you always go out to your 30 or 40 foot. You know, that's kind of like, I guess, a highway, you know, for migrating fish. Get out there. Now it's deeper, but, you know, now you start going to federal waters and then, you, you know, you really can't be out there with possession. You get caught with a bass and you're out in those waters, you get some hefty fines. But yeah. um, bait would be number one. If there's any type of structure in that area, it's nice to troll around some structure. Just don't get snagged on it. Um, and then just basically bottom and just start trolling and see if you start marking fish. If you're marking clouds of bait, sand hills, maybe some squid on the bottom. Or again, if you see bunkers or anything, just troll in an area. And then if you get that fish, work that area. Don't just leave it. You know, you get a fish, keep trolling and then say, let's circle back now, mark it, hit the man overboard. Same thing as fluke fishing. You catch a fluke, 
hit man overboard because there's going to be more. There's not just going to be that one fluke there that you caught and go right back and do that same drift again. And boom, you'll see as soon as you hit that man overboard, you can get some more, more fluke. Same thing with bass fishing. You mark, you get a fish market, <clears throat> go up. If you don't get another hit, come right back and go over that mark again and see what happens. Yeah. we got to remember there's, they're schooled up. So if you mm. caught one, there's, there's no way it's alone. Yeah, there's going to exactly. be a lot more there. Now, if they're still there when you come back, who knows? Uh, but you know, it wasn't alone. There were other fish looking at your bait when it went through that water. Yep. So head back and look. So you're looking for the structure for all the, looking for the bait. I assume birds, um, birds, bait, any blitzes, so, <laughs> blitzes. And also with the bunker too, if you can't see the bunker, if you're in shallow water, you can see a mud trail. They're pushing that bottom. So even though you might not see them splashing or flashing, you'll see the water. All of a sudden, you get this chocolate trail of water, this mud. And that could be them kicking up the bottom. So look for that. Also look for purple. If you see the water looks a little purplish, that's them. You know, when you're looking through the water, they have that purple hues coming off. Yeah. That's another way to spot them. They always don't have to be splashing. You know, they could be right there and right next to you. You'll never know it. The side sonars are great. You can find out, you know, so much bait with the side sonars. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So here, here's the question that um, that I really wanted to ask, and this is more to help out everybody else than to help me out personally. Um, can you share with people how you are going to approach a blitz when you see one? So let's say you're coming out there, and let's pretend you're the only one, right? You're the only boat out there. No one's going to be on this blitz with you. You see it pop off. You see the birds. You see the you see everything bust in the water. Mm -hmm. How are you going? And let's say you're trolling still, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to be tossing anything else in. How are you going to approach that with the boat? Well, this actually just happened while we were trolling. Um, we see the bass come up. We have two mojos out. We're in shore. We're probably about 30 feet of water off the Rockaways. And we see the fish come up the bass. I basically just gave it a little bit more throttle, not too much. Came up a little, and as soon as I got close, I came back on a throttle, trolled through it. Both both rods went off, and we had two bass right away from that. Now, are if, you – go ahead. I'm sorry. So that's because I had rods in the water. If I didn't have the two trolling rods in the water, I see a blitz. I would go – I would definitely pick up the speed, but listen, you don't want to run and gun because you're going to put those fish down. You come flying up to that thing and come back on a throttle – you're scaring the shit out of those fish. They're gone, you know, unless it's like this huge, massive blitz going on and they don't care about the boat. But if you see some fish popping, like you, you definitely want to go more of a stealthy mode than flying up there. There's nothing wrong with getting going fast to get to it, but don't get on top of it. Then pull the throttles back, pull it back a little. Listen, you can cast pretty far with these lures. You don't have to be right on top of these fish, you know, and definitely I, I think the motor and the sound and the splash and something coming towards these fish, it, it definitely scares them and puts them down. Well, yeah. I know it could be a giant predator coming at them. That's going to attack them as they're attacking, you know, the bait fish. So definitely, yeah, don't go so fast up to them, slow it down and get to them and start casting, you know, and hopefully you can capitalize on it. Yeah. And you're, you're trolling the outside edges then? Yeah. Well, one thing about the mojos, if you're trolling around those bunkers, you could troll all around those edges, man, they'll slam it sometimes because they, you know, think it's one of the bunkers and here it is yeah. coming through. If you're out there by yourself and this is, you got to do, if you're by yourself, there's nobody else out there with you. If you go right through that bunker spool, sometimes those rods get annihilated because you literally spread that bunker spool school. And now here comes two laws right through the middle. You know? right. <laughs> it is any fish that they slam it. You don't want to do that with people though, but we've done that. We're out there by ourselves and you just, you annihilate the fish if they're on it. Well, it's that's, that's why I said watching. you're out there alone because there are, there are different <laughs> tactics. <laughs> yeah, no, you can do that when you're alone. Definitely. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, especially when these schools are so thick. The only problem, sometimes you do snag them. You'll snag the bunker on the uh, mojos. Yeah. And you just got to reel them and take them off and set them out. But it's pretty amazing. Even once you know, you, with the bunker too, like back in the day, when we used to snag and drop. Yep. So we, what I would do is that we would snag a bunker and it's in the school. And the same thing, like what I was telling you when we Kobe fish, you just pop that rod, you know, with the bunker. Now it scares the other bunker. Now you got this one injured one in the middle. And bam, they would slam it. So I got to tell you, Joey, I went out. Um, God, it was a day I was sick. I had COVID and I went fishing. <laughs> um, you know, what else are you going to do? So I, I headed, I headed out to the Raritan Bay out on the kayak and snagged some bunker. I just snagged it on a soft plastic. I put it on the circle hook, tossed it out there. And I'm just sitting there and I was like, you know what? It, I'm going to pop it just like you had said. And I'm watching the school break up. And once you know, every time I popped it, I was getting the fish. Yeah, it and works. Got, got some works. nice upper forties in there, nice. you know, about God, an eighth of a mile off the beach. It's sick. 
yeah so there were there were some nice fish in there but i i just kept thinking about what you were saying you know just give it that pop let well, it, it school up and then give it a yeah. pop it totally yeah. makes sense because now you disperse that so that alone is going to get the, the, the fish's attraction like what what's going on there why are those fish disperse and all of a sudden there's one injured fish in the middle and the guy's like really this is easy yeah <laughs> he's gonna swim up and eat it and that's it yeah that, that's yeah, a good I had, trick that definitely works i had the habit of just doing too much popping mm -hmm. but i started doing as you had mentioned let it school and then bust the school yeah you know let them it's, it's spook the school and then yeah. they all leave <laughs> my poor guy sitting sitting and there going it. in circles dinner done <laughs> yeah. it definitely works it's it's crazy yeah, it's, it's all great. the little tricks that you know make the difference yeah exactly exactly <laughs> all right so so we talked about the rods talked about the reels talked about the the leaders and the line well let's talk about the leaders okay. specifically um how are you setting up the spoons as an sure. example on the braid I just do an all bright and then I'm, I like either 80 or 60. Those are my leaders. Okay. Sometimes floral carbon, mostly not just plain mono, you know, on the spoons. And that's usually about 15 foot a liter. And then I always use ball bearing swivels. Definitely you want yeah. the ball bearing. It makes the spoon work a lot better than the traditional, you know, plain, whatever don't call swivels. Um, definitely go with the ball bearing, invest a couple extra dollars, to get the ball bearing swivels. They work so much better. And you don't have to get the like, huge tuna ones you don't need them that big but you know a nice decent ball bearing swivel i don't know what, what it is maybe 200 pound that i'm not even sure what they are yeah. and then i'll lead it for the mojos um i'm sorry for the wire we'll go to the wire now wire either you could use the small uh spro spoons it's a two 230 i think they are they're tiny though those little swivels i'm sorry did i say yeah. spoons i meant to say swivels the tiny little swivels the spro 230s use those to do that and you can just do the um the uh the wire then to the uh swivel and then to the to the monofilament you could do that or you could just do the haywire twist in the wire and then do an all bright knot from the mono into the wire so there's no swivel with so it's like a direct connection now yeah you could do that as well do you I think that's on my that? it works yeah i actually have it on my youtube page too how to do that knot um it works it's, there's nothing wrong with it a lot of the bait stores do it because when you put a swivel into the spool so say you what are you what are you backing is whether you're using mono or whether you're using braid or whether you're using dacron if you're backing so now you put your swivel on there, right? Now you put 300, 350 feet of wire. It gets buried and it stays moist in there. And a lot of times that will start corroding right. the swivel over time. So now you're letting out the wire, all of a sudden, bink, you lose everything because the, the swivel was totally corroded underneath. And you have no idea. It was sitting from last year. Right. You know, that's another reason why I take them out, clean them, and check everything to make sure before you use it for the season. So now you have that all bright knot. There's nothing in it that's going to rot. It just wire on top of your mono your braid or your dacron whatever your backing might be also you guys too it's nothing as nice you use the high vis dacron if you're going to use it you know or high vis mono just where you could see it you know yeah. all that wire is out now you know exactly where it is instead of using a regular white or multicolor, whatever mono the high vis really works good and you could see like how far out so you say oh yeah get the swivel to the water you know so let out all the wire and put the swivel in the water well, now you know exactly where it is you could see that bright line going out I'm a fan of all the high vis stuff now that I need glasses. <laughs> Cause I don't like going on the water with them. You know, it definitely it, works. It's too much of a pain in the neck. All right. So we've got the leaders covered. We talked about the spoons and the mojos. Are there any other lures that you're trolling when you're out there looking for striped bass? Well, definitely the swimming lures. Like you talked about the mans and the, right. uh, the red palas I use. I like those. Um, you could parachute. I mean, there used to be a spot, there was this, this rock pile that was close to the beach, and you would mark the bass on there. And it was so funny because I would tell people, all right, get ready, you're going to get a fish right now. Because you knew that once you hit 300 feet, that lure was on the rock pile, and it was going to get hit. And it was every time, like, okay, get ready. It's going to come right now. You're going to get hit. And all of a sudden, boom, the rock would go up. Yeah. Parachuting was fun. It's like you don't see many people doing it anymore. Montauk, you still see it, but you do not really see the people parachuting anymore. But that's a lure that works fantastic. You know, it's just a simple, basically a mojo, a two-ounce with a red pork rind on the back of it or a fat cow strip, whatever. You know, that's another great trolling lore. Um, what else do I do? Spoons, mojos, rapalas, um, hangers, Eels. hanger shads. I, you know what? I didn't do that yet. That was the hot thing. It seems like this year, a lot of big fish were caught on trolling those eels with the planers going out. I don't know if you see, you see that yet. I have not. Okay. Now what, what's the, what's the reality on that? So that's like the new hot way to troll now. I didn't get into it. I didn't do it. I, so never, I can't even speak on it because I didn't do it yet. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, I know what they do is, is they have these planers, like salmon planers, to get those lines out. And they put all these lines on it, and they're trolling rigged eels, live, live eels. And they're saying these fish are coming up, blowing up on them. 
Uh, actually, Raf has a video of a trip he did where they, they did it, and it was just it's phenomenal. A fish to 50 pounds blowing up on these eels trolling. So that'll be the new thing you'll see. Everybody's going to get into it. It's new. I think it started two years ago Yeah. that I know of. Maybe it was sooner than that. I mean, longer than that. But that's the first time I heard of it was about two years ago. So and now you have to get all new stuff again. You have to go get a plane and a board. You have to get this. <laughs> and the eels. And eels aren't cheap at all. Eels are like, what, 250 a piece now? It's ridiculous what they get for eels. Plus the the bill to clean all your clothes afterwards and yeah. get the slime mm -hmm. off the boat. Disgusting. God, they really are. <clears throat> I say it all the time. I hate them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, they disgust me. <laughs> I'd rather go bucktail the bridges at nighttime and eel the bridges. Not Absolutely, <laughs> it's much cleaner. <laughs> it takes a lot to get me to uh, to eel. Yeah. I used, you know, it's a lot easier when you're fishing in a boat. But there were there were times in my boat where you know I had one get down into the bilge. Oh wow! I was like, you got to be kidding me! I can you can never get it out, so you just have to wait for it to die. They'll probably and live it for years. Oh, yeah. And the they, boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you have to deal with the smell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're terrible. I can't stand them. Uh, best bait, best natural bait there is, I think. The eels. But uh, yeah, but I try to avoid them. I'm just that guy. Sorry. No I'm wrong just with that. that guy. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. Um. So we're we're actually up at the <clears throat> hour right now. Are there any things, Joey, that that we should be that we haven't covered that that you would like people to know about trolling? Okay. Basically, go with the flow. If you see everybody trolling north and south, troll north and south. <laughs> because you have that one guy, he starts going east and west, and he's going over everybody's lines, everybody's screaming and fighting. Like, if you see what everybody's doing, and you're in that pack of boats, do what they're doing. If you're on your own, and there's nobody near you, do whatever the hell you want. But you definitely got to respect the other people out there. And, you know... Don't cause any issues because you're going to be that one guy that everybody's going to be screaming at on the radio. Hey, you blah, 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 blah. What the hell are you doing? If the people are trolling north and south, troll north and south. If you want to troll east and west, no problem. Just get away from the fleet. Like, don't yeah, troll man. amongst the fleet doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing, you know? Raram Bay, I mean, you, you see it. That's a big thing over there. People go in every direction. It's insanity. It is. Yeah. So Ed doesn't like to go up to the Raritan with me, but I was out with this guy, Randy, and we're in kayaks in the middle of the fleet. <laughs> and uh, it was the most entertaining day. And it was a really, really tough day. You know, it was mm -hmm. like the one day in the last 14 days where nobody was getting anything. So we were just picking up, you know, shorts and, you know, regular slots instead of all these over slots. But it was the most entertaining day, and we're sitting right next to each other, both with our radios on, because we can hear people <laughs> yelling at each other. People are yeah. I mean, one guy actually pulled up to another boat and made him give him replacement weights and lures for the ones he cut off. Oh, wow. when, he, <laughs> when he trolled, it happens. <laughs> it's what I'm saying. Oh Go with man, the flow. I trolled right through the middle of uh, all these boats jigging, and uh, he cut off he cut off two boats. <laughs> Yeah, but it was, it's I'm crazy. sorry. Well, I just find it entertaining when you, you watch that and you get to listen to it. We're just sitting there in the kayaks. People are like, you're crazy being out here. Someone's going to hit you. I'm like, but it's so entertaining. The springtime, it it's so madness fun. over there. It's. Cr I mean, we go there too in the springtime because it's the only spot where the fish are. They're not by us yet. And you go there and you can load up. But I mean, listen, they got 200 feet of line out, These, you know, to troll and, and people go yeah. in every direction. You got to, I mean, yes, Rarity Bay is still big, but it's still small. You know, and it's right. <laughs> it's just nuts. Well, especially every, where I was angle. fishing, I was fishing back near the Arthur Kill. You know, so yeah. I, I, we weren't we weren't out in the big section. You know, we were deep, and I don't know. It was it was fun, and you just see the people uh, smiling as people start yelling on the radio. You can you can <laughs> see the boats going by, and they're just looking at each other, smiling, and everyone's listening. But yeah, I think it, yeah, it it's is. you got to be really careful though when you're trolling because you, you can you can very quickly. Not only cross up somebody's <clears throat> gear, but you can very quickly ruin multiple people's day. Yep. You know? it's, again, it's expensive stuff. It's you know, it's not cheap. The people are gonna be pissed. Now like you lost a fluke rig. All right, it's a three dollar rig. No, you lost two hundred dollars worth of gear, you know. Right. It's nuts. Well, this this guy was replacing two ounce sinkers. That's how that's how petty this this one yeah, guy was. I wouldn't worry about the two ounce sinkers. <laughs> he, he's he's tossing them two ounce sinkers. It was awesome. That's insane. Drew, Drew says it's you PA guys who have no idea what they're doing. Hey, you know what? I will say, Andrew, you know what? It is everybody. It is everybody in that bay. I see people come out of New York. I see people come out of uh, New Jersey. And I hear the Philly accents. Yeah, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of idiots out in the water. I don't care where it is. 
And yeah, Raritan's a dangerous, dangerous place in the spring. Raritan and, can uh, be dangerous. Yeah, it's crazy. I actually think it's worse in the spring than yeah. in the fall. The fall, I think everybody's kind of uh, practiced and they've been doing it for months and months and months. And it's like, I don't know. They get all geeked up for the spring. They just launched the boat. They run out without all their gear yeah. tested and everything. And they try to make something happen. They're, they're all getting, you know, sitting on and hibernating for so long. They're dying to get out there. And it goes crazy. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> hey, is Lorenzo still on? Can you see him on there? Uh, yeah. He's still on. He had his personal best with me recently on the boat, too. He had a 49 and a half inch trolling. So it does count. <laughs> Well, I mean, it counts. It yeah, counts. It nice as long fish. as as long as you catch it, it counts. As far yeah. as I'm concerned, and then you know what? And plus, you have the release. The release is awesome. Put that fish in the water. You swam it for a while, and then just watch it swam swim away. It was awesome. Yeah, but you get some big fish with that trolling, especially these mojos too. It's a lot of fun, but it's definitely a technique, and you know you just gotta make sure you don't get the lines tangled. Number one, and again, watch that. Watch that. Uh, the prop wash is the easiest way to do it to keep that boat straight. To do that. Yeah, and so your season ends. Is it correct? It ends December fifteenth. I believe so. Yeah, so you have like the uh, the shorter season up there uh, than we have down here. It looks like Joey's a little frozen up right now. Um, uh, oh, yeah. So we can still hear you. So we're all good. Um, all right. Any last thoughts, Ed? Do you have any last thoughts? I can see myself moving. No, I I think uh, I think we touched on pretty much everything. Um, okay. You know. I'm kind of looking forward to going trolling. Anybody so has any other questions? Basket down. Yeah, and <laughs> if there are any other questions, throw them in any now. Any more questions from anybody? No. I like that last question. That was a good one. Yeah, there's some there's some good questions. I mean, a lot of these guys, you got people in every range of experience in the in this these streams and in the chats, and it's great. It makes for great questions, great conversation. Uh, you have one guy saying trolling is boring. I, I personally don't typically like to troll, but I, I would like to troll from time to time. It's something you got to experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, guys. So, listen, I would we're say an I would hour. troll into Shin, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're, we're at an Can hour now. So, uh, we want to uh, wrap this up now. I want to let everybody know that next week we're going to be back, but Ed is taking off. He has said that he refuses to come to work next <laughs> next monday so we're actually going to have a salt strong coaches show we're going to have multiple coaches from different areas all up and down the east coast of the united states through texas um, so if you have any questions for any of these salt strong coaches come on we're going to have multiple <clears throat> coaches there to, to answer questions throughout the entire show and uh, again the podcast audio from these live streams does come out every friday so hope to see you all there next week and with that said, until next week, until next episode, get out there, get on the water, and get some tight lines.